going to be the first one uh, talking in this round table, my comments may be a little bit of a higher uh, level in the sense of being a slightly more abstract. While I think that both Albert and uh, David will try to uh, say things a little bit more concrete. And as uh, Rafael was mentioning, the question that motivates many people these days and that we wanted to uh, address today is whether or not we need to rethink the way in which we do macroeconomics and more concretely the way in which we evaluate economic policy. The answers uh, or the arguments in favor of yes, we need to change things are I think rather obvious, although perhaps not particularly insightful. The first one is just that the duration and the depth of the crisis is quite unprecedented in countries like Spain. We have been in a recession since 2008. That has been already uh, more than four years. And if you look at this picture, this is a very, very depressing uh, picture that uh, Tano Santos, who I think is one of the most insightful Spanish economists, he's a professor at Columbia, always likes to present. I'm actually borrowing it from him. The blue line is the amount of loans to real estate developers. This is the famous bubble, the big loans on the books of the banks. And what basically what you see over there is that there has been no substantial reduction. Just a little bit over here, but to a very, very large extent, we still have not really digested this enormous amount of bonds, of loans, and you know, if we want to come back to anything like over here in 2005, which, yes, it is true that uh, Rafael says that economics is not about forecasting, but my conditional belief about events that can happen in the future is that there is not going to be an easy solution to this problem in the very short run. And it is also true that maybe uh, many macroeconomists didn't emphasize enough issues like financial frictions or the interactions between the financial sector and uh, the economy, although I think that if you actually read the literature carefully and read the good journals and not what people talk about in the, um, in the, in the media, which sometimes despite their potential famous names are people who are not particularly well informed about where current economics is, I think this was a little bit unfair. I will argue though that my position is a little bit different. I will say first that some of the main lessons that we learned over the last decades about modern macroeconomics have been particularly useful. Uh, one of my absolute top favorite papers ever is by Neil Wallace, 1981. It's about the relevance of open market operations. Basically, what uh, Wallace explains in that paper is that if we sell short-term government debt and we buy long-term government debt, or we do the other way around, nothing is going to change. It's, I know it's a very loose description, I only have 20 minutes, but basically what this is telling us is that things like quantitative easing are irrelevant. They just don't have any effect on prices or, all, or on allocations. Uh, economists who have studied Tom's textbook knew about this because in, he has a wonderful textbook from a few years ago where he has a few chapters where he talks about irrelevance theorems. I think they are something called like Modigliani-Miller theorems applied to economic policy. Tom explains very carefully how in a very general uh, class of setups you have these irrelevant theorems. Well, macroeconomists were saying this in 2008, 2009. However, if you pick absolutely any newspaper in the planet, or you watch any TV station, they were saying things like, oh, there is going to be hyperinflation, quantitative easing is going to be so tremendously uh, bad, it's going to destroy the US economy, or the other way around, people were saying, oh, unless we have quantitative easing, the US economy is going down the tubes. I think that the logical position in 2008 was, was saying, I don't think that quantitative easing will make much of a difference, and I think that time has vindicated the insights from Neil Wallace. Uh, I had a student who claimed, it was quite funny, that the US by January the 1st, 2012, the US economy will have collapsed in hyperinflation. And I say, well, because I was basically explaining Wallace's result and he just refused to accept it. And I say, well, let's take a bet. Let's meet again on January uh, the 1st, 2012, and you will pay me $1 million. 
uh, think about it in this way, you know, if you are right, who cares? If I'm right, you know, uh, it will be interesting. Uh, of course, he didn't want to take the bet. A pity. Anyway, and the second point I want to emphasize, and this is perhaps not sufficiently well appreciated, is that modern economic theory is an operating system, not a word processor. What do I mean by that? Um, when you are working within an operating system, Windows or Mac or Linux, what the operating system is giving you is a set of instructions about how to build applications. And you can do it to write Excel or to write Word or to write Angry Birds or whatever you want. So you can use the tools of modern economic theory to write papers or models about fiscal policy, about monetary policy, about redistribution, about political economic issues. And economic theory is not imposing on you the very limited set of, of things that, for instance, a word processor will impose on you. So every time I hear people saying, oh, economic theory doesn't really say anything particularly deep about, I don't know, redistribution and fiscal policy, my answer is, no, no, it's not that economic theory is not uh, capable of saying that, it's that no one has written good papers about it, but if you think there is something interesting to say about it, please go ahead and write down a paper that uh, addresses these issues. And you know, just waving your hands and saying, oh, we don't know much is not a very constructive way to do things. As one of the deepest lessons I ever learned in economics is actually from Tom. Uh, he loves to say in class, it takes a model to beat another model. Um, so how do macroeconomists think about, moneta about policy in general, not monetary policy, this is my bias, about policy in general? Well, there are basically uh, three different perspectives. One is to try to find what the optimal policy is. It's trying to say, well, given some constraints and given some protocol, protocols about how the government and the agents are making decisions that are either embodied in some technological constraints or some informational constraints or maybe in some constitutional arrangements made ex ante, how are we going to do optimal policy? What is the optimal response, for instance, of the monetary policy to a bubble, to a real estate bubble? The second point or the second main activity that we do is refers to political economy. By this, I mean the interaction between uh, economic policy and the political structure of the country and how these two interact over time. And finally, there is a pure uh, approach that is uh, a pure empirical approach that is based on a much simpler question, but yet at the same time surprisingly subtle of what happens when we do A. You know, what happens when we raise the interest rate or what happens when we lower taxes? And we are interested in knowing, yes, uh, the answer to that question, uh, because in some sense also the answer to this question is going to help us to think better about what is the optimal w uh, policy and it's also going to help us understand a little bit better the political economy. And I think that the current crisis uh, is a good way to ask a lot of questions about each of these three different ways in which we think about economic policy. Of course, given the limitation of the time, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about each of them. I just put in, for each of the three cases, a long, long list of uh, things I would like to have a better understanding. And I would love to see people writing papers about it. I'm not going to say much about macroprudential regulation, but I think it's interesting uh, to spend a little bit more time, for instance, about what are the monetary and fiscal policy reactions to a bubble. I think that among economists in 2005, 2006, uh, there was a, I would say, rather widespread understanding that there was a real estate bubble. I think that uh, that was particularly true in Spain when even the policy makers, both at the government and at the central bank, made explicit statements regarding um, this bubble. And yet, there was not much done about it. Part of the reason may have been that we didn't know how to react to, add to it. Part of the reason may have been that we thought that the burst of the bubble was not going to be so bad. In 2001, there was the burst of the bubble of the internet. It was not such a big deal. So, you know, there was an argument to be made in 2005, 2006 of, well, when this second bubble burst, it will not be uh, so, terrible, so terribly bad. So, you know, we, we really want to understand uh, more about how to react in those situations. Uh, David is going to talk a lot about uh, 
uh, wall with low interest rates with the zero lower bound, and I'm not going to take uh, his time. Uh, I want to mention a couple of other things that to me are quite important. The first is, and also this is work uh, on an area where Tom has done a lot of very, very important work, which is the need to have policies that are robust. Uh, you know, imagine that this is, of course, never going to happen, but tomorrow I'm appointed some position of responsibility, let's say governor of the Bank of Spain or president of the European Central Bank. And, you know, I know my macro models and I know what I teach in class, but I'm going to sit down in that table and I'm going to close the door and I'm going to think, oh, my God, I don't really know. What if I'm wrong? Uh, can I design policies that take explicit account of the fact that I may not be able to fully describe the world that surrounds me or that I have some fear of having made mistakes in the way I think about the world? Also is the issue of ambiguity. It's the issue that is very difficult in real life to express probability distributions about events that are going to happen. I made a living doing something that is called Bayesian econometrics which basically is based on the idea that you can express always a set of beliefs that describes events of the world, possible events of the world. Something like, I know that with a 20% probability, the stock market is going to go up, with 80% probability it's going to go down. Well, unfortunately in life, there are many, many situations where it's extremely difficult to elicit those probabilities, those set of beliefs. And yet, I want to think about setups, decision theoretical frameworks where I want to do the optimal thing uh, implicitly, oh, sorry, explicitly taking account of this ambiguity. And last, uh, monetary policy or policy in general in the presence of heterogeneity of beliefs. Something that has surprised me a lot of this crisis is when you go out there and talk with people that participate on the market or even with policy makers, they had very, very different set of beliefs in their heads about what can explain what is happening in the world. And we know that when there is heterogeneity of beliefs, a lot of uh, things uh, can happen, and in particular, that uh, there is a lot of action, for instance, in asset pricing, there is an old paper by Krebs and Wilson many, many years ago that makes this point very, very clearly. A lot of things can happen when you have this heterogeneity of beliefs, and I think we know surprisingly little about how to conduct uh, policy in this, I think, empirically relevant case where we have heterogeneity of beliefs. Uh, since I don't have much time, I'm not going to, terribly, uh, not going to say terribly much about the empirical uh, questions that I have. One that to me I think has come up to the front is the idea that foreign sector constraints are more important than what, than what we suspected for countries like Spain. If you take a class in international economics, of course, we will always talk about foreign sector constraints for Argentina, for Brazil, etc. But I never really thought I will be reading papers by people like Guillermo Calvo about uh, sudden stops or about uh, runs on, on a currency, or in the case of Spain, runs on uh, sovereign debt. And yet, I think that all these papers in international macro have a lot of important things to say to more, you know, kind of traditional macro, and that perhaps we didn't pay a lot of attention to it. I think that the current crisis also tells us a lot about, uh, oh, sorry, ask us a lot about understanding the behavior of the labor market. This is a graph uh, that I'm borrowing from a presentation actually by Narayana Kocherlakota, who is the president of the uh, Minneapolis Fed. And what he's trying to argue, this is something called the beverage curve, which is a purely empirical relation between the number of unemployed people in the US and the number of job openings, so the number of advertisements. And of course, the empirical relation is that when there are very, very few people unemployed, there tend to be a lot of job openings. And when there is a lot of people uh, unemployed, there tend to be a lot of uh, uh, very, very few job openings. And the interesting thing is that even if in the US we were along this line most of the time, we have moved in this direction way up, way uh, uh, from the from the very, very curve. So the reason is, you know, the question is what is happening with the job uh, with the job market, you know, why we are having this situation. In Spain, of course, in a country with a 25% unemployment rate, the question is even more important. And uh, this is another graph that I always uh, use uh, to illustrate this point. This graph I'm actually taking from Samuel Ventolila, who is at CENFI uh, working with uh, Rafael, and he uh, is a great expert on the Spanish labor market. And the way Samuel always reads this paper, uh, reads this graph, is look, this is the drop in employment in Spain, this is the drop in economic activity, and this is real wage. 
the real wage is going up. Okay? So during 2008, 2009, 2010, the collective bargaining agreements were inducing increases in the real wage where we were destroying around, you know, like what, 0.5% of jobs every single quarter. Uh, this is telling us that we really, really need to understand labor markets better and that there is something very important about it. And finally, uh, the issues related with uh, political economy, many of them already appear in Tom's talk, in particular issues like the strategic interaction in a monetary union. Uh, the best way I think about uh, what some governments in the European Union now are doing is basically they are playing a game of chicken to see who is the first person who blinks and then take the surplus all for them. I'm also very interested these days in thinking about the lock-in effect of bad institutions, the fact that if you generate very bad institutions, they are going to create a set of people, who, a constituency that is interested in keeping these bad institutions, and that really puts you, excuse me, in a very, very tight spot. Uh, but let me finish, since Tom talked about history, uh, I'm also going to talk about history, and it's also going to be Anglo-Saxon history except that I'm going to go back one century before. And this is, to me, the main lesson that I learned from uh, this economic crisis. In some sense, I already knew it because I had been taught uh, that lesson, but you know, I didn't really fully appreciate. What is this? This is 1694. This is a painting, a drawing, of uh, the signature, the signing of the charter that created the Bank of England. In 1688, William of Orange, uh, and Mary, uh, his wife, were invited by seven prominent members of the British elite to cross the Channel, land in the United Kingdom, and depose James II, the last of the Stuart kings, because they believed that he was encroaching on their traditional liberties and that he had a setup to introduce in the United Kingdom, uh, well, back then it was still the Great Britain, sorry, to introduce in the Great Britain an absolutist system similar to the one uh, that uh, the Bourbon had imposed in France. And uh, the Stuarts were a, a big, big fans of the French system. And you know, after all, James had spent a lot of his life in France during the time, uh, the Commonwealth time. Well, the problem is, as you can imagine, that the French are not very happy about this because suddenly William of Orange, which is one of their main uh, opponents, their main foes in, in, in the continent, in Europe, is also suddenly the new king of England. So there is a war that starts very, very soon. Uh, usually when you study it in the Spanish high school, um, well, at least you used to have to study these things. Now probably uh, you study some stupid thing about uh, self-confidence or something like that. But anyway, when uh, in the past you actually had to do some real content in high school, we used to call that the War of the League of Augsburg. And what is going to happen is that surprisingly enough, the French Marine, the French Navy defeats the Royal Navy very, very severely, and the British are about to lose the control of the seas, which is the basic foundation of their strategic position. And the government in England has run out of funds. So what they do is they contact a bunch of the main leaders or the main elite merchants in England, in London, and they gave them Basically, the big trade-off that they do is the following. We are going to give you the monopoly of emission of uh, notes, of uh, currency, fiat money, within London and a uh, surrounding area of London, which for all practical purposes is the, is the hardcore of England and most of its economic activity, in exchange for a huge loan. And in, in, with this new loan, they are going to build a new Royal Navy, they are going to defeat uh, the French, and they are going to go on to uh, start the big century of conflicts within uh, England and, and France that will, of course, eventually end up in Waterloo with the final defeat of the French forces. Why is this long story? Where is this going to? Well, basically, I think that this explains that at its very core, <coughs> fiscal and monetary policy are always one and the same. That you cannot talk about monetary policy without thinking about fiscal policy, and that you cannot talk about fiscal policy without thinking about monetary policy. And that in some sense, the mother of all the central banks and the template in which all the other central banks in the world were created, which is the Bank of England, was created at the beginning not because of the need of uh, doing monetary policy. There was not the feeling that there was any major problem with monetary policy in England, but because of fiscal policy. And how the uh, Great Britain, England, changed 
its institutional arrangements in a very, very deep way, and that had huge consequences for their economic policy, precisely because of these fiscal constraints, which I think links nicely with some of the issues that Tom was mentioning before. So to me, this is the main lesson of this crisis, and the thing I would really like to understand much better. Thank you very much. Thank you.